Today's sermon is one of those sermons which pastors do not want to preach. Matter of fact, all my friends are laughing at me because they know I'm preaching this today, and all my friends are going, God bless you, you'll probably be dead at the end of the sermon. In the first service, there were seven tomatoes, eight rocks, and two bullets, okay? But I did get through it because the fact is there's a glass barrier here. But the point is this, this is one of those sermons. And then second part is this, you're gonna say to me, but this sermon has no relevancy, but it will have relevancy for you because I'm gonna give it to you so you, it is relevant. So some of you online stream that are too quick to turn things off because you don't like it, God have mercy on your soul because you should be listening to this whole sermon. Here we go, are you ready? Colossians, we're studying Colossians, we don't skip verses like some pastors do in order to sell books, we tell you the whole counsel of God. Are you ready? Colossians, are you ready? Wives! Submit yourself to your husband. Now see, in the first service, there were five guys who said amen. Okay, so, uh, okay. As is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, mothers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Slaves, oh, the Bible endorses slavery. We'll talk about it later. Obey your earthly master in everything and do it not only when their eyes is on you to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, slaves, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for a human master, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrong and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Let's deal with the first one. Here we go. And all of a sudden, half of live stream has turned off and said it's not relevant and Jesus will get them. Wives, submit yourself to your husband as is fitting in the Lord. If it is not of God, you do not submit. The fact is this, if it is not of God, you do not submit. When it says, as is fitting in the Lord, and by the way, for some of you wives who pull this card, that's not fitting in the Lord, okay, you better make sure you pull that right. What is biblical? Example, my husband is abusing me. That is not fitting in the Lord. You don't submit to that. Your husband is asking you to do something that is not biblical, it's a sin. You do not do that. Example, uh, we've had ladies who have uh, husbands who want to take them to a certain restaurant and, and that restaurant has a night show where there's nakedness and nudity, that's not fitting in the Lord. Your, your husband will turn to you and say, look, I'm smoking this joint, here, take us, you know, hey, you're supposed to submit. No, I, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So, so the point is this, it's not you know, a, a blank check where uh, no matter what he says to me, uh, I have to submit to him, it's fitting in the Lord. Let me read to you Ephesians chapter five. Wives, submit to your husband as you do to the Lord. Ephesians 5, 24, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to your husband in everything. I love this one, First Peter 3, 1, wives in the same way, in the same way, submit yourself to your own husband so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. But as, here's the key, as you do to the Lord, which means you, you, can, you submit through righteousness, you submit as a witness if he's not a believer, and you submit as worship unto God. Now, 
Here's the craziest part about it. The husbands have more to do than the wives. Here, husbands, Colossians 3.19, love your wives and do not be harsh to them. But if you go over to Ephesians 5, it says this, husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing of water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or without any blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, the husband ought to love his wife as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does for a church, for we are all members of the body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and for some of you husbands, you need to pay attention to that. You need to grow up, okay, and stop being mama's boy. Get a life, okay? and be united with the wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am take, talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect. First Peter 3, husbands in the same way, be considered as you live with your wives, and treat them with respect as a weaker partner, and as heirs, and you of a gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder in your prayers. I've read a lot, let me explain it to you. When he says weaker partner, he's not saying the wife is inferior or second, the wife is not, okay? God does not think females are second, wife or inferior or anything like this, but let's tell the truth. During Paul's day, they didn't have to deal with wokeism, inclusivity, anything like this. During Paul's day, what they're saying is this. The average female is physically weaker than the average male. Now, let me share this with you. Not in all situations. I have seen some ladies that scare me. Okay? And it doesn't matter what size they are. There are some of you who are little. Okay, you look like you could rip me apart. Okay, and, and, but let me tell you something. In average, men are physically stronger than women. Now, this does not mean that the Bible preaches against women being in, in, um, as soldiers, although there were no women soldiers in the Bible. Uh, female soldiers, but the, my son, he's a cop, and there are female cops, and he has no problem with this, and there's nothing wrong with that biblically. But, we, uh, but my, my son will tell you that they, they have to carry, uh, they, when they're in a fight, they have to use their batons and all this stuff much more than my son does. He's six foot five, and you know, a cop is, a lady, one of the ladies cop who worked with him is around five foot six, give me a break. So Paul's not putting anybody down. Now what, what he says is, husband, you treat your wife like Christ treats the church. Now wives, all you have to do is submit and just respect your husband, but he has to treat you like, like Christ treats the church. Now, Christ gave himself for the church. Oh, Christ washed the feet of the disciples. Okay? Christ was a servant. He was a blessing. This, this whole thing of machoism, where a man walks in and says, woman, get me a drink. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's not biblical. The fact is this, he is there to serve, he is there to love, he is there to help. Whatever Christ is to the church, that's what a husband should try to be through the Holy Spirit to a wife. He gave his life for the church. We give our life for our wives. And what happens is then he goes on and he says, your body, he says, the fact is when you become one, her body is just as precious as yours, therefore you need to treat her body just as precious as yours. You, nobody ever who is in the right mind takes a hammer and starts smashing their hand. And how dare you try to smash your wives? We treat her, we treat her the way Jesus treats church. We are co-heirs with Jesus Christ and what we do is we treat our wives as co-heirs with us. 
fact is this, that my wife and I, when we went into marriage, she knew the scripture, I knew the scripture. Now let me explain this to you, how we knew the scripture. The Lord told me ahead of time who I was gonna marry. I had never met her, I never knew her, I never had heard of her name. The Lord gave me her first name and her last name. That day, my pastor phoned me and he said to me, he said, there's a guy named Fred and he's sick, go and do his Bible study at his house. I said, what Bible study? It doesn't matter, when you get there, they'll tell you, just read scripture, they'll do everything. I get to Fred's house and I have this girl's name and, and, and in my head, but I don't know anything about her or where she is or whatever. And I get into the Bible study and I sit down with everybody in the Bible study and I said, um, uh, what are we doing? They said, First Peter. And I said, First Peter? What, what's First Peter? And they read it. Wives, submit yourself to a husband. And then some girl in the group, young adult girl, goes, I don't believe that. And I said, who are you? And guess what? That's my wife today. <laughs> so do, do we disagree? No, not at all. The fact is this, that very few times I've ever had to pull the wife, submit yourself. Matter of fact, I've never pulled it. But there has been times in our lives when we've got to a decision making where we could not decide what to do, but we had to make a decision. It wasn't, we, it wasn't, we didn't have to, we had to make a decision. And the two of us were blank, and she would look at me and says, you need to make the choice. You're the head. Now, I hated it when she did that. Because the fact is this, I will take her opinion over my opinion nearly in 95% of what we do. Example, let me explain this to you. It is not wrong for me to do this because Psalms 31, if you follow Psalms 31 about the lady in Psalm 31, my wife is in charge of our finances. A matter of fact, to be honest with you, if she died, I would walk into the bank down here and say, hi, my name is Billy Richards. My wife just died. I have no idea what I'm doing. Could you help me? Okay, she knows all the accounts she knows. I have no idea. She takes care of all the bill pain. She takes care of, yesterday, she was out taking care of the leaves on the front lawn while I was doing laundry. Somebody says to me, that's a wuss move. Men should be out there doing leaves and guys should be doing laundry. No, here's the truth. She was so gracious to me because I didn't want to go outside yesterday. So I said to her, look, let me do the laundry, which is easy. You press one stinking button and you go watch TV, <laughs> right? And she's out there killing herself on leaves. Woo, woo, woo. She was the one that decided that. I have no problems. So what happens is for the man Okay, if women get their nose out of joint on, you know, oh, I'm not going to submit to him. The reason is because him isn't loving you like Christ loves the church. Now, let me also share this with you. The fact is this, that we need to come into line with Scripture. And for some of you who are singles and you say, this has nothing to do with me. Yes, it does. I'll tell you why. How many Scriptures have you ever read where your nose gets out of joint and you say, that's a bunch of garbage. I don't believe that. I'm not going to follow that. You can't choose and pick Scriptures. And what he says is when you do these things, you're doing it unto the Lord. What is fitting for the Lord? You're doing it as worship the Lord. So when I am loving my wife as Christ loves the church and she is submitting to me, as, and, and very few times we've got to that area, the point is this, we are worshiping according to Scripture. Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing. Now then he goes on and he talks about children. And he says, children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Can I just share this word? The word obey there means biblically obey. If your parents are asking you to do something that is not biblical, then you don't. But if your parents are asking you to do something, now somebody says to me, well, when you get older, 
and your parents keep phoning you, okay, and you're 40 years old, and you have four kids, and you're trying to take care of your wife, and they keep trying to dump a guilt trip on you, but the Bible says obey, and you're 40 years old, it doesn't matter, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible, okay, that you can't start, you, you need to obey us even until we see Jesus, you know, and then you use the scripture with your parents, and a man shall leave his mother and father, okay, and only visit you at Christmas. But here's the one that gets me, is father and mother do not embitter your children or they will become dis discouraged. And I, I say this in love. My mother was one of the most phenomenal ladies on earth. I have the highest respect for her. And if she was here, she would say, go ahead, use me. She's with Jesus now. But when I was a teenager, okay, and of course none of you have parents like this, my mother would keep pushing my buttons until I exploded. And my dad would come home and he would go over to her and say, back off the kid for a half an hour. He's about to explode. And she could not get it in her head that I was gonna explode. She just kept pushing and pushing. Now, yes, we as parents, and some of us have become so stinking soft because we absorb too much of society where, we, where kids just get away with, well, murder today. And what, what you sow, you will reap. But my dad, he never, he never gave me an inch, but he never also pushed my buttons. What he would do is say, Billy, go in the living room, I want to talk to you. And he would go in, he never yelled at me, he just would sit down and he would talk to me and he'd say, okay, present your side. And I would present my side and he would, you know, then he would talk to me about his side and then he'd say, this is what I want to do. And instead of pushing my buttons, what he did was he sat down with a little bit of honey and helped me work through it. And yes, I did get discipline, but instead of having a fight, what he did was he made it, let's have a discussion. And for that reason, and I know it probably wasn't right, it was easier to obey my father than my mother, although my mother is a great lady. But let's deal with the slave one. Whew! Bible's not endorsing slavery. Matter of fact, the total opposite. What he's doing is he's helping the slaves who are in the congregation of Colossae trying to figure out should they escape? Should they run for their lives? Should they strike? Should they protest? Should they kill their master and take the house over? What should they do? Now, for Paul to write, God is totally against slavery, it would have meant nothing. So what he's doing is he's trying to be practical and say, okay, yeah, there are some slaves in the church and they need some direction. Let me give you some direction. And here's the direction. Are you ready? You're in slavery. You have been bought. It's not right. But guess what? God knows. God is taking account of this. God is tabulating it. And when you get to heaven, God's going to bless you. And when you are working in slavery for that master, even if it's not right, realize every inch you're doing, every effort you're doing, you're worshiping the Lord. And when you get to heaven, you will be blessed. And I love it, it says anyone who does wrong will be repaid for the wrongs and there is no favoritism. In other words, don't you worry about it. You don't need to get revenge on your master I'll take care of it, God says. Now, somebody says to me, there's no slaves in your congregation church on the Queen's Way. There better not be. But here's the truth. Put the word employees in there. When was the last time you were a witness, not because you were sharing Christ with everybody at work, but you were a good worker? 
Yes, you got a lousy boss. Yes, your pay is lousy. Yes, he kisses everybody else around you. Yes, Satan has set you up to look bad in the company. But the fact is if you remain faithful, and let me give you the illustration. Are you ready? I get excited when I talk about the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. They were taken into slavery as young boys, as young boys, and they came up through that, that, that heathenistic kingdom as slaves. And yet, what did they do? Instead of not, well, we're not going to give our 100%. No, they gave 100% because when they're given 100%, they were doing it as worship unto God. And Shachran, Meshach, and Abednego, when they're in the fiery furnace, they were a testimony to the entire kingdom. Daniel, when he was in the lion's den, was a testimony to the kingdom. And what God is saying to you is this. As an employee, or as a slave, or as a whatever you want to call it, do your best in order to be a testimony to the kingdom. But then he goes on and he says masters, and the word masters here, let's change it to boss. Provide for your employees with what is right and what is fair. Now there's very few people in this room who have staff, but I'll talk to you about this, and I'm not saying this to be rude or ignorant, but when, when I came here 19 years ago, the church was doing their best, and there is no criticism. They were doing their best, but they weren't paying the staff right. And I've always believed that church people should be paid right, okay? There's no reason why church people shouldn't be paid right. And, and what, you, what you pay is what you get, whether you like that or not, okay? And, and when I came here, they were, they, they, I don't want you just ripping people off, but they were hurting people. And so the board sat down with me and said, okay, we don't know what to pay church staff. I said, well, the Bible says that we should pay what is right and what is fair. A workman is worthy of hire. And the board said to me, yeah, okay, we'll do that but show us what is right and what is fair. And I said, well, why don't we pay the staff according to the Board of Education and the Toronto Police Force? So you're wondering what, what, what all these staff and pastors make will go to the Toronto uh, School Board and go to the Toronto Police Force and you can figure out what the staff are making. Because that is fair and right because this is what's going on in society as normal. Now, if you're a teacher, you're saying, I'm getting ripped off. I've never met a cop who said he didn't deserve more. And I've never met a church staff who said I wouldn't like more. But the point is this, what is fair and what is right? So somebody says to me, that's great, but give me the application. Okay, are you ready? Number one. We need God to help us, okay? I would like to put, we need God to help us dot, dot, dot when we don't like scripture. Or when it's stinking hard to do. Billy, you don't know where I work or you don't know what my husband's like or you don't know what my wife's like or you don't know what my father's like. Lottie, and I understand, here's the truth. It's not me, it's God. We need God to help us. We need God to help us. Number two, we need to make our attitudes and our actions worship unto the Lord. Let me share this with you. How many jobs have I had where it was just painful to go to work and so forth, and God would say, you're doing it for me, do it right. How many times have I ever had to smile when I didn't want to smile and I knew I needed to smile because it was worship for God? Let me share this with you. The, number two is my application. Make your attitude and actions worship on the Lord. How many times as senior pastors, somebody take me off and I wanted to use what's in my head and let it come out through my mouth? Okay, and just take them up this side and down the other. And Jesus says, worship me, worship me, worship me. And I've gone, hallelujah, God loves you. And then I've walked away saying, Jesus, thank you, I didn't blow it. 
Number three, eternity will make it right. This is the most important part. You know, we have RSPs here, retirement saving plan, where you put so much money in and the church tries to match it. It's very little, but we try to do a little bit. Your biggest RSP, retirement saving plan, is the eternity. The fact is this, some of you are trying to cash your dividends in with God now. You're trying to cash in now. God, I want it now. But you're not understanding when you get to heaven God's going to say, hey, you know that job you had? You were faithful. I know it wasn't good. It was lousy, but congratulations. Well done, good faithful servant. Here's your inheritance for eternity. Hey, you were faithful. And here's the best point in, well, I guess all of them were best, but here's the one. Are you ready? Pray. Get the strength. The strength will give you wisdom. Strength will give you patience. I don't know anybody who doesn't need to pray to be a better wife or a better husband. I'm not joking when I say this. I've been married to this beautiful lady who is phenomenal. And when I say phenomenal, she is for 39 years. But I pray all the time, Lord, help me. I don't know. See, here's the craziest thing, and I need to just be transparent. Some of you ladies will just freak out when you hear this. We men do not know what women think. We really don't. And it's from the Garden of Eden. Adam had no idea what Eve was doing. And, 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 and so it's not my wife is weird. It's I am I have no idea, and, and you know, once I start to know her, she changes. And, and what, we, what I say to, and it's a good change, but, but in prayer, Lord, help me to treat her not the way I want her to be. Are you listening? Not the way I want her to be, but Lord, help me to treat her the way you want her to be. Help me to treat her in such a way. I treat her in such a way as you treat the church. And in prayer, God, when I say he gives you strength, there's so many little insights that God can help you do little crazy things in order to make your marriage even better. God doesn't always make sense to us, but we do not, but we do need to trust him. Now, for some of you who are single, you you say, I I still don't get much out of this except for the employee slave stuff, okay? Let, Let me take it through, you are ready? If Christ wants me to treat my wife as Christ treats the church, being single, Wouldn't it be also important for you to start treating people around you as Christ treats the church? Everyone should treat everybody as Christ treats the church. Because Christ treated everybody that way, whether they were believers or not. He gave his best to them. Number two, if you're single, If the scripture is bothering you, like some of those who are married and children, you don't blow it off, you work it through. So it becomes part of your life. And the one that gets me, if you're single, is this. Don't look at marriage as being negative but look at it being positive. Probably one of the most positive things I've ever done in my life is getting married, and I was not pro-marriage. See, before I got married, three of my friends were getting divorced. Can you imagine? Three of my friends were getting divorced before I got married, and so I was not pro-marriage, and I'm saying, Lord, three of my friends are getting divorced, like, hello. But see, when you do it God's way, it's phenomenal. God doesn't always make sense, but we do need to trust him. Let me tell you the story. 
I was 16 years old, I needed money in the summertime, okay, just like any 16 year old, okay? And what happened is I got this incredible job, and well, I thought it was incredible, and I went to work for this guy, and he called himself a Christian, which turned out to be wrong. And the more I worked for him in the summertime, the more he started making me do stuff that I thought wasn't right. And finally, one day he said to me, at the end of a work day, now tomorrow when you come in, I want you to do this, this, this. And that was cheating. And he was making me do it instead of him so that if he ever got caught, he could blame it on, well, a 16 year old kid did it. I would, I would take the hit. And when it says, slaves, be obedient to your master, I went home and I'm, 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 I'm praying, God, this is not right. He's gonna make me cheat. And, and you know what, I, my dad taught me I should be a good employee to my boss, but, and as I prayed, it, I, be honest with you, I was up half the night. So I went to work before he showed up and I went, into his office, which the, the door was open all the time, and I took a piece of paper and I wrote him a nice note, dear sir, matter of fact, I called him by his first name, dear Mr. So-and-so, thank you so much for hiring me at this time, I'm handing in my resignation, uh, you don't need to pay me for any more money, but the point is this, I'm out of here. And then I wrote, uh, thank you, and then I signed my name. He phoned me at my house, and he started yelling at me, chewing me out. And I, I said, well, I'm not coming back. And instead of getting into an argument with him or trying to correct him as a 16-year-old, I just let him yell, and then I, we hung up. My dad came home that night, and I sat down with him, and he says, I hear you quit your job. Can you explain why? He was not happy. And I started to explain to him, why, and my dad congratulated me. And then my dad said, let me pray that you get another job. Two days later, I got a job better, higher pay, and something I enjoyed better. You know why? God showed me when you follow his ways, he will strengthen you, and he will bless you. Now, has every job I ever had been phenomenal? No, matter of fact, truthfully, no. Being senior pastor of this church, I love being senior pastor, but there's certain stuff in this job I just dread. I dread. And if you have a job that you love everything in it, you haven't hit your peak yet. But the craziest thing is this, the things I dread I need to still be faithful for. Some people dump them. They only do all the stuff they like and then they neglect that. No, God has called me to even do the dread stuff and I need to do the dread stuff better than the stuff I like in order to show worship unto God. So let me take you back to the beginning. Yes, there are scriptures that are not really exciting to me or, wow, yes, every scripture I just jump up and down for. And usually those are the scriptures that kind of go against what I want and those are the scripture God wants me to deal with. Why? Because when I do, I worship God. I worship God. 